Good evening. I think we've got everybody in the right seats and I uh, want to welcome everyone. My name is Sam Morganti and I want to welcome everyone to tonight's event. Thank you for attending and uh, thank you for attending the event here at the Jackson Center. Um, this program is a celebration of things that happened 50 years ago. During the course of this year, we've heard a lot about things that were at that time. We've we celebrated two Americans walking on the moon. We heard a lot about Woodstock. And here in Jamestown, we had our own momentous event 50 years ago. Um, a local attorney announced that he wanted to be mayor. And today's program is a tribute to the remarkable, extraordinary career of Stanley Nelson Lundeen. The program will feature stories from Jamestowners, uh, as well as Lundeen family members. Um, these are people whose lives and careers have been influenced by this man, Stan Lundin. Uh, we will also have the opportunity for, to view a world premiere of a documentary uh, that was prepared for today's program. And if you have not yet seen the exhibit, and I think most of you have not, when we leave, we're going to go out this door here to the left. The exhibit will be open. And please spend some time taking a look at what's in the exhibit room. Um, to kick off the program this evening, I'm going to ask the Jamestown Mayor, Sam Teresi, to introduce a very special guest. Just so that everybody knows when the program is over, I'll be out in the hall uh, offering Sam Morganti stories about uh, <laughs> past years. Just an added bonus to your program tonight. Uh, when Kristen McMahon contacted my office last week and uh, requested if I'd be willing to introduce a special guest, the 77th Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, uh, I jumped at that opportunity, obviously. Uh, Kathy Hochul is somebody that I've long admired for her commitment to public service at the town level, uh, at the state level now, the congressional level, um, and uh, also in the private sector. Um, Kathy, to me, is easily one of the best lieutenant governors that the state of New York has ever seen, and there's been recent studies done by New York State historians that have put Kathy in a tie with three other lieutenant governors in the state of New York. You can use your imaginations into who they might be. I'm going to tell you. First one was Mario Matthew Cuomo. You may have heard of him. Young 48-year-old guy that was picked by Hugh Carey to be his lieutenant governor and served from 1978 to 1982 when he ran for governor and succeeded Hugh Carey as governor. The second one is a guy that I, a friend of mine, that I always enjoyed being in photo ops with. That was the six foot five former mayor of Rochester, Bob Duffy, with me, five foot six, standing next to him. And as you could tell, both of us never wound up in the same photograph with each other. <laughs> the third one, since Kathy also made the list of the top four of all times, any guess who it might be? <laughs> You're right. Erastus Root from 1822. <laughs> Erastus Root served with Joseph Yancey for a period of two years. And Governor Yancey's claim to fame is he interrupted the legendary and historic term of Governor DeWitt Clinton, the guy that built the big ditch across New York State. Well, I'll tell you what. If Erastus Root showed up here today, I'd have a few things to share with him. And what I would tell him right to his face with my finger in his nose is, Mr. Root, I know Stan Lundeen. <laughs> I've worked my whole life with Stan Lundeen. Stan Lundeen is a friend of mine. Erastus Root, you are no Stan Lundeen. <laughs> and while we're at it, Mr. Root, you're no Kathy Hochul either. It's my pleasure to bring to the podium a good friend of mine, a great public servant, our 77th Lieutenant Governor. Let's give Kathy Hochul a great Jamestown welcome.
course, you forgot to mention the last lieutenant governor from the city of Buffalo, which was Billy Blue-Eyed Sheehan in the late 1800s. So you gotta get, gotta get your, uh, you know, I, it's always a surprise and delight to be introduced by the mayor I have many times. Usually there's a big fat check in my hands when I'm meeting the mayor, uh, the downtown revitalization initiative and projects like we uh, talked about. For this particular facility, $1.5 million for here. So he always has his hands out when he sees me. So I'm kind of waiting toward January when I can just get a normal hug without him asking me for money. So this is looking forward to this time. Uh, but it's been a, a pleasure to serve with you, Mayor, and, and to see this community that is so beloved by everyone in this room through your eyes. And the transformation that has occurred here since 2000 and you've been in office uh, to oversee a transformation of this community to bring back the waterfront and hotels downtown, the comedy center, downtown housing, and to really put a special spotlight on this magnificent treasure we have here, the Jackson Center. And so I wanna thank you on behalf of the people of not just this community, but the entire state of New York for your incredible public service to, to our mayor once again. But. We're not here to honor you. You'll have plenty of those uh, tributes flowing in, I'm sure. But I also do want to acknowledge our, our county executive is here. Great to see him as well. And former uh, member of the assembly, who we realized I was a staffer when Raleigh Kidder was a uh, member of the assembly back. So I, yes, I can, I can play that. I, was, uh, I met my husband in the assembly office when we were interns 35 years ago this year. So that's, I can date myself as well. So. Uh, and Sam and to uh, Joe Zanetta, thank you for doing an extraordinary job with this special event. I, I really, I was so touched when I walked in and saw the, the beautiful room. I don't want to give any spoiler alerts, but there is a room dedicated to Stan Lindeen just uh, around the corner here. And to Ashley for the beautiful work you did. And I understand that Netflix is trying to get the rights to the documentary. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they think that this is going to be, uh, you know, Maybe the Sundance Festival as well is going to have, a, have this as a top winner. So, so we're all excited about seeing the, uh, the Stan Lund team, the true story. Uh, so that's going to be good. And to Stan, to you personally, but also to your family. Uh, I've been in public service. This is my 25th year of elected office. And uh, I also know the sacrifices that Sarah and John and Mark have had to deal with. And so to them for offering up uh, your beloved father, husband to the community, as a very visible, very active, uh, and often gone uh, public servant, we thank you. Thank you. I want to give a special round of applause to the Lundeen family. <laughs> and Kristen McMahon, thank you for all the great work you're doing here. I'm looking forward to coming back. Uh, you know, one thing lieutenant governors are particularly good at we're really good with ribbon cuttings, right? Right, Stan? I mean, we, we know how, we, we, yeah, ever since I was in kindergarten, when am I going to need this skill? Well, it's come in handy about 4,000 times, and unfortunately many times here in Chautauqua County. So when we opened the expansion, I actually thought that the $1.5 million they were asking for was to build the Stan Lundeen room. I mean, I was a little surprised. <laughs> I, that's why I jumped at it. I mean, the, yeah, I, I, how could I say no to that? But uh, it's, it's been great. I do have um, just a couple thoughts on Stan. It's fascinating to me how our lives have paralleled each other, and I was not even aware. Uh, we both started in local office. We both ran for Congress in a special election. We both won our special elections. We both received phone calls from Governor Cuomo summoning us down to New York City, and neither one of us expected to be offered, uh, considering we're from Western New York, a part of the state that's often forgotten. Uh, to be offered the opportunity to serve as lieutenant governor. And so, uh, so from local office to special election to Congress to now serving as lieutenant governor currently and having had a chance to work with Stan when he was lieutenant governor, uh, I know how tough it is. And there's probably very few people who can speak with uh, the same personal experience that I have. But I also know that Stan never lost the sense of his self. I mean, despite the titles, despite, uh, you know, the, the adoring fans, the people from this community who love him so much. Um, he never forgot where he came from. And I think that's a special sign of the kind of integrity that he always exhibited. He was always grounded. And there's a lot of people who go off to these positions, you go off to Washington, there's people saying, oh my God, member of Congress, Lieutenant Governor. He never lost that. And that's, that's an extraordinary tribute to his family upbringing, the, people of this community that were part of his story from the very beginning as a 30-year-old 
to support a 30-year-old running for mayor. I mean, I think that's a kind of an extraordinary cool thing to do. I think it should happen more often. Uh, but, I, but I also want to th say this community made Stan who he was, and he never, ever forgot you. And I want to thank him for his years of service, the sacrifice, what he did as lieutenant governor, talking about the needs of upstate New York. And I know it's tough because there's a lot of strong influences pulling the cloud of Albany down to New York City. There's a lot more people elected there than there are upstate. But he always fought for this area. And as a fellow Western New Yorker, I knew it. And I never lost sight of how important that was, that we had a voice, a champion, an advocate to fight for the people of his beloved Jamestown, Chautauqua County, and upstate New York. So I want to have a proclamation from uh, the other Governor Cuomo. Uh, uh, and it's a real long one. And unlike the county executive, I'm not inclined to read a real long proclamation. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure his are better written. I don't know. I'm sure he just wanted it. But, uh, but he does talk about his, throughout his exemplary career, Stan's unwavering civic commitment and expertise made him an, an invaluable resource to everyone around him, from Governor Mario Cuomo to the countless people and organizations who benefited from your mentorship and your leadership. And so, Stan, from a grateful community, a grateful state, all I have to say with a heart full of gratitude is say thank you. Thank you for all you've done for the people of the state of New York. Thank you very I was not going to miss this one. Thank you. Thank you. I also, the other skill that I did not mention yet, he was a darn good softball player on Capitol Hill. Uh, I, was a, I was a young staffer working for Congressman LaFalls, and all the other offices from Western New York fielded a team. We had Jack Kemp, Hank Nowak, uh, Stan Lundin's staff, and John LaFalls' staff. No other members of Congress showed up to actually suit up, put on a glove, and go out in the field, but Stan Lundin was there to play ball. <laughs> Thank you, Governor Ho Hogel. Um, we're going to hear a lot today about what an incredible leader Stan Lundin was. Um, the first indication those of us from Jamestown in 1969 had about his leadership abilities was the crew of people that he assembled with him to run in 1969 for the county legislature, for the city council, and people who came to be part of something called the Blue Ribbon Ticket. When you go into the exhibit room, you'll see some memorabilia from the Blue Ribbon Ticket. And I just want to name some of the people who were there, because these were people who were instrumental in Jamestown's history and, and people who just brought leadership to this community. We had people like Miles Lasser, people like John Y. Carlson, people like Sam Calera, Dr. William Tracy, uh, Randall Chadwick, Sandy Anderson. Those are the people who ran as council members at large. And that's not even going into the people who ran for the county legislature or for the districts, the city districts. So those six people were an indication of the kind of leadership that Stan was going to be able to bring to the city of Jamestown. Now, Stan won the election. And um, as, as, he re, as he has remarked, um, there were two things going on. One is that Stan refers to being mayor as the best job he ever had. And the other is that Stan admits that when he became, became mayor, he had never supervised anyone other than the secretary in the, for, in the, in the uh, firm of, 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 uh, of Lundin and Ford. And that Stan needed people with him in City Hall, and he recruited people to work with him. Um, some of those names are, are people who are familiar to us today. Joe Johnson, Mark Hampton, Steve Carlson, and one of the other people is going to be our next speaker here. Charles Chuck Hall is somebody who grew up with Stan Lundin here in Jamestown. And Chuck was Stan's uh, city controller, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to Chuck to let him talk about uh, his work with Stan in City Hall.
Sam. Thank you, Chuck. Friends and family of Stan Lundeen, and especially the Honorable Stanley N. Lundeen. It is a great honor for me to be a part of this celebration in honor of your long and productive career in public service. Stan and I played golf as teenagers. We still play golf together today. We attended the same college about 10 hours by car away from here, and we used to race back with people like Veer Lindquist, Bruce Hagedorn, Charlie Goodell, Peter Robinson, among others, to say hello and goodbye to our parents and rush down to Mike and Sam's to see who could be the first one there. <laughs> After finishing graduate school, Stan came back to Jamestown to start a law practice. I went to Philadelphia to become a CPA. In the summer of 1969, a group of us, after playing golf, went to the night lounge. I know some of you might be familiar with the night lounge, but it was somewhat of a girly show down on the corner of 2nd and Washington in those days. We had been playing golf, but we came down there, and all of a sudden, Stan surprised us by suggesting that I'm seriously considering running for mayor of the city of Jamestown. After we stopped laughing, we said, <laughs> he said to us, what job would you like Let's go around the table, and if I'm successful, I will offer you that job in the fall. Well, I picked finance because nobody else had. I forgot all about it, went back to Philadelphia, and did not pay much attention to the election. The morning after Stan won the election, my father came up to him on the street, congratulated him, and said, I'm sorry the Democrats won, my father being a staunch and active Republican, and please don't let the unions run you. Well, Stan called me that night saying that he had won the election and offered me the job of finance person, saying it's now time to put up or shut up. <laughs> I thought about it for a while, especially as to how I could assist my then 85-year-old father and 66-year-old mother by coming back to the community and quickly said yes. I then called my parents. The next morning, my father again accosted Stan on the street. This time went up, put his arm around him, and said, thank you for bringing my son home. <laughs> so things changed. Then the hard work started for Stan. He had to convince the Democratic successful candidates from his blue ribbon ticket, who were elected to the city council, that it was a good idea to pick a Republican as his chief fiscal officer. Stan and I, working off-site, Developed a budget for 1970 without the help of my predecessor, who left town long before his term ended. At the inauguration on January 1st, I was voted in by the eight Democrats, while the four incumbent Republicans voted against me. <laughs> I was then given a job at $17,500 a year for a full-time position while Stan was given what was supposed to be a part-time position for $10,500 per year salary. The vote did not please my father, and he publicly lambasted those four naysayers. As a result, three of the four came to our home and tried to justify and explain their position in voting against me. It did not work. <laughs> I have had the opportunity to develop and manage five annual budgets for the city while working with an outstanding and creative leader. His dedication to and love for the city shown through everything he did. Among his many accomplishments during those years were the successful recruitment of Cummins to fill the empty art metal plant, to consolidate the Jamestown Social Services with the Chautauqua County Department of Social Services, to turn the Jamestown Airport into the county airport, to establish the Labor Management Committee, and to work on the Brooklyn Square after the Urban Renewal Project to allow the development that you can now see having taken place in Brooklyn Square. In 1974, Joe Johnson, also a former Navy Supply Corps officer, took my position as Director of Finance. 
Stan continues to be a wonderful man and a good golfer. He shot his age last year, which is quite a, an accomplishment for those of you who are golfers. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you, Stan, for the opportunity to come home. Thank, thank you, Chuck. So Stan becomes mayor, it's 1970, and he and some of the people around him begin to look at government going beyond Jamestown City Hall. Um, his original campaign team decided to look for a candidate to run for the state assembly. They found one, but there were a couple of minor problems. Uh, that candidate was immediately challenged in a Democratic primary, and that candidate also happened to not be in the country. He was in Vietnam in the Navy. To help with this person's first campaign in absentia, Steve Carlson gave me a call and asked if I could help reassemble some of the group called Youth for Lundeen. And when I told the story to Mark Lundeen, Stan's son, he said, Youth for Lundeen? What was that, you and five of your friends? <laughs> I said, you're right, that's exactly what it was. It was me and five of my friends. <laughs> so uh, most, if not all of you, know who Raleigh Kidder is. Uh, Raleigh went on, won that primary, lost the general election in 1970, ran for the uh, county legislature, uh, and subsequently in 1974 won a seat in the state assembly. So I am honored to introduce Raleigh Kidder, who will pick up a story from there. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Raleigh. I want to make sure I can get back. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be here. Stan, you're out there someplace. There you are. Uh, and when Stan uh, knew, I, I think had something to do with my speaking here tonight, he, he said, keep it short and make sure it's not a eulogy. <laughs> so with that in mind, I thought I would stay on the light side a little bit about what it was like back in the Lundeen era. In the, in the early days, and um, Sam has brought you up to date a little bit on where I was, I was in Vietnam. Yeah, in 1969, prior to going to Vietnam, I'd stopped back in Jamestown and I had done some research at the Post Journal and I thought it was a possibility of long shot to run for the assembly, and uh, Stan uh, encouraged me, uh, and I went to see him, and uh, the next year, in 1970, he sent me a letter saying, if you want to run, I'd be happy to support you. And there was a mail strike on in Vietnam. I couldn't get in contact with them. So one night, late at night, about midnight, when the phones finally worked in the Mekong Delta, I got through to the Cameron Bay Naval Station Station. Just so happened, the guy had answered the phone. I'd been on boats with uh, minesweepers in Japan. He said, I'll send you uh, a telegram to Mr. Lundeen that you want to be a sacrificial lamb in the Democratic Party. <laughs> And so that's the way we got going. I mean, Stan, I, I think, must have thought I was a, either naive or a political masochist or both. I'm not sure, but that was, that was the way it all began. I'll never forget that night, 1970, Stan, when I lost that election. I'd been back home since July. I was tired. I campaigned for full time pretty much for it, and I was exhausted. And Stan came up to me that night at Democratic headquarters and said, we're, go we're going to the Republican Victory Party. I thought he'd lost his mind. You need to congratulate Jack Beckman on winning. So with my tail between my legs, Stan and I drove over to Liberty AC Club where they were having that victory party, and I congratulated Beckman. It was one of the many of lessons I would learn from Stan. Politics is important. But it's just politics. Don't let it get too personal. Sometimes you lose. The public decides who's going to be elected. Politics, he taught us, is also a good thing and needs to be fun or at least combined with a sense of humor. For example, I remember when Stan coined the word woodchuck empire to describe the Republicans in Mayville. They didn't like it, but we thought it was a pretty good <laughs> George, you, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not saying this applies today, but I'm saying back in those days, we, we thought it was a pretty good description. Of course, what goes around comes around, so pretty soon the Republicans had named the blue ribbon ticket the Lundeen machine. 
So I became a part of that lending machine. The following year, 1971, was a better year. And I, it was mentioned, I ran for the uh, county legislature and won a seat. Um, you know, there was another visionary around at that time, and I wanted to bring this out to you tonight. Uh, a lawyer from, a uh, prominent lawyer from town, Democratic county chairman from time to time, and supervisor from the town of Bustite, Joe Jirasi. He's here tonight, or I saw him earlier. And Joe, you know, had brought a lawsuit saying that the county supervisors were not legally constituted because they didn't have one man, one vote. You came from Arkwright, you represented 900 people. You came from Busti, 8,000 people. They both had the same vote in Mayville. And the court agreed with Joe Girasi. So we started to have weighted voting in Mayville. And then we had a county legislature. In the year I ran and Stan asked me to run, I must admit I was a bit of a carpetbagger. I'd lived in kind tone, but I did move into Jamestown to run that year. Uh, we had a, three uh, legislators in the same district from the south side of Jamestown. And there were two Swedes, Ed Johnson and Ted Vimmerstedt and me. And guess who the two, two top vote getters were? It wasn't me. <laughs> and it's, of course the Swede leading the ticket that year uh, had another great election. Another thing happened at election of 71 I just wanted to add. Uh, I met another Swede, Svenska Flick, a nice looking gal from the north side, and she came down to Democratic headquarters that night by the name of Jane Dawson. And you know the rest of that, that's history, okay? <laughs> by the way, I took her to Johnny's Texas Hots for dinner after. <laughs> She'd never been there. <laughs> In 76, Stan ran for Congress in a special election, and again, the name Carpetbagger came up because his opponent had lived in Washington, had been in politics down there, and had come back to run from Corning. And so we ran Stan as a local guy against this Carpetbagger, as we called him. You know, it's sometimes fun to nickname your opponent. This guy, his name was Snowden, and we named him Snowdo because <laughs> we figured he'd bring in a lot of money from Washington. Some of you might remember that. And later on, Stan had an opponent who was a professor from St. Bonaventure, and he was a priest. We called him the priest with no prayer, and Lundin won. <laughs> God apparently is no respecter of persons. We learned a lot in that election. One more inside baseball reflection, and it was mentioned earlier. Uh, in 1986, because I'd been in Albany and was no longer in politics, but I understood Albany a little bit, I thought Stan might be asked to be lieutenant governor because uh, Mario Cuomo was unhappy with his current lieutenant governor at the time, a fellow by the name of Del Bello from Westchester County. And Stan didn't think so, but he got a phone call. And he, as Kathy Hochul said earlier, uh, it changed his career. And, and Stan became, I think, as she said, uh, a terrific go-to guy for getting things done in Albany and especially for upstate. Um, Stan, I might say in that 1976 election, my mother never thought you were going to get elected. I don't know if I ever told you that. She said he doesn't speak well on the radio. And she, was, she used to listen to George Flieger on that WJTN news program every day. And she'd say, I don't think he can make it. But she was, she was very happy when you did get elected. I went, Mothers aren't always right, you know. But um, here we are. and. Uh, this may be Stan's 80th birthday, but the real reason we're here, I think, is to honor someone, one of our own, who understood the honorable profession of elected politics and went to great heights in pursuing it, mayor, congressman, lieutenant governor of New York State. And finally, Stan, uh, you've made a great contribution to this institution, the Jackson Center. And you know, in a way, it can line up the dots. If you stand for good government, for good principles, for good things, good things can happen. Whoever thought that a lawyer from Jamestown who started in Washington as assistant general counsel to the Internal Revenue Department, you talk about the bottom someplace, would become solicitor general, attorney general, Supreme Court justice, and chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. But, you know, if you stand for good things, good things can happen. So we're proud of you, Stan, and all of us cherish our friendship with you and the lessons you taught us. Thanks for being you and for standing up for what good government's all about.
Thank you, Rally. Uh, next part of our program, we're going to shift gears a little bit. And I want to start by a thank you to a young person who put together a whole lot of this program. Uh, Ashley Gray, who is our summer intern from St. Bonaventure University. And Ath Ashley's now a senior at St. Bonaventure. She prepared the exhibit that you're going to see, as well as this video that we're going to show next. Uh, when Ashley was asked to do this, she was a little too young to have remembered any of this. So we, we kind of set her off and said, look, you're going to have to figure some of this stuff out. So when I first met with Ashley back in uh, May, Ashley said, hey, I've already discovered the Stan Lundeen archives. And I said, really? There are Stan Lundeen archives? And she said, yeah, over in St. Bonaventure, there's a whole bunch, I'm sorry, it's, it's SUNY Fredonia, there's a whole bunch of Stan Lundeen material. So she started work on the project and then discovered a second set of Stan Lundeen archives. And that was over at the Fenton Historical Center. And you'll see in the, in the room next door here some of the things from the Fenton Historical Center. But then she found the mother load of Stan Lundeen archives. Turns out that the mother load of Stan Lundeen archives was in Barb Lundeen Goldsman's basement. <laughs> so what you're going to see in this video and what you're going to see in the exhibit are things from the Stan Lundeen archives, but she also talked to a number of you people who were here in the room and did interviews with you. And we want to thank you for your remembrances of Stan and your work with Ashley. So what I'm going to do is ask Ed to cue up the video here, and we'll get a chance to see the world premiere of the documentary that Netflix is now going to show next. Jamestown had plenty of other responsibilities. 
Being mayor of Jamestown then, we were the sole sponsor of the community college. We had a hospital. Uh, we had a bus system, an airport, the largest uh, electric municipal electric system in the state. The city was trying to do more than it was capable of doing, and it just couldn't handle you know, all the stuff that it was doing. And he downsized the city. Stan uh, took the leadership in legislation that uh, would transfer any city welfare department to the county's budget and to the county's responsibility. As mayor, Stan believed Jamestown would benefit from redevelopment. He initiated an urban renewal program in the hopes of bringing positive change to the city. Stan was also an environmentally conscious leader. He understood how crucial environmental awareness was. On April 22, 1970, Stan teamed up with the Kiwanis Club to demonstrate the effect of pollution on Jamestown. In Jamestown, New York, the Kiwanis Club arranged to dump 20 tons of sand in a downtown area to show just how much dirt falls in one square mile of the city during just 30 days of maximum air pollution. Stan also signed the Earth Day Proclamation in 1970 along with several other United States and world leaders. In January 1976, Representative James F. Hastings resigned. Stan decided to run in the special election to fill the vacancy. Most people said you don't have a chance, even my closest contacts in Washington and so on. We put together quite a team in a short amount of time. And, uh, I think the Republicans never thought it would happen and never been Democrat elected in the Congress. Despite the challenges, Stan was elected to the 94th Congress. This was a remarkable win for Stan as he was the first Democrat to be elected from the district since the late 1800s. Unfortunately, the celebration was short-lived. Elections for the 95th Congress were right around the corner, and Stan needed to continue campaigning to prove to his district that he could lead them. Stan's hard work paid off as he was re-elected to the next five succeeding Congresses. During his time in Congress, Stan was a leader in efforts to generate domestic and international economic development and continued to encourage labor management cooperation. He also took the leadership in legislation dealing with radioactive waste from West Valley. West Valley was a depository for nuclear waste. It had accepted nuclear waste for a long time. Then they were going to decommission it. And then that's when Stan prepared the legislation. The West Valley Demonstration Project Act brought many jobs to the area and served as a demonstration for other nuclear facilities on the solidification and removal of nuclear waste. To recapitulate briefly, this bill that I will sign now will provide a joint federal state partnership which will be innovative in nature, set a standard for the rest of the country in the disposal of nuclear waste materials. Stan also proposed legislation to reform international economic development programs and served as chairman of the International Development Subcommittee. In 1986, Governor Mario Cuomo was looking for a lieutenant governor to campaign with him for the upcoming election. Many people speculated that Cuomo would ask Stan. So, you know, there's only three Democrats I mean, my, at the time, in my view, upstate, north of the Tappan Zee Bridge, who have the same positions on things like the death penalty and so on that Mary Cuomo. And so I said, you're one of the three. <laughs> and you're the most senior. You're a congressman with some terms behind you. You've won upstate. And he's got to go upstate, I think. On November 4, 1986, Governor Cuomo was re-elected governor of New York and Stan was elected lieutenant governor of New York. To have a lieutenant governor come from way out here in a small town, rural area, not Buffalo, not Syracuse, upstate, Jamestown. I mean, it's a very significant. Stan was assigned several positions as lieutenant governor. He was the chairman of the governor's anti-drug abuse council, head of the job training partnership council, and an advocate for high-speed trains connecting New York cities. He also traveled on behalf of the governor and was considered the voice of upstate New York. 
Stan also helped bring the president to Western New York. The first time was in 1992 when candidate Bill Clinton was on the road for the Clinton-Al Gore campaign. Stan introduced Clinton to a rally in Vester Plaza at the Chautauqua Institution. to the state was unparalleled and many believed he would make a great governor. He came close twice, once in 1992 when Governor Cuomo contemplated running for president and again in 1993 when President Clinton considered Cuomo for the Supreme Court. After the 1994 election, Stan retired from electoral politics and returned to Jamestown. And he chose to come back here and get involved in an area and an issue that we really needed, some guidance. <coughs> Stan was involved with many other local organizations and currently serves on the board of directors at the Robert H. Jackson Center. Stan never forgot Chautauqua County. Even though he left here, went to D.C., went to Albany, he came back here and tried to fulfill a need. Now he and Sarah spend a certain amount of time at their home in North Carolina, but they also have a residence here. And I don't think he could ever get that out. I really don't. This is home. Thank you again, Ashley. That was just great. I think everybody here appreciated that as well. In the video and from a couple of our other speakers, we've heard a lot about the scope of the mayor's job. Uh, in 1970, in addition to the normal municipal functions of public safety and parks and recreation, we've heard about how the city of Jamestown ran an airport, a hospital, an electric and water system, a trash collection agency, a transit system, a city-sponsored community college, and administered the social services programs locally. Most importantly, for those of us who can remember, the mayor also had something else that was really important to do. The mayor had, a, had to establish a contract with a local farmer for horses to plow snow. <laughs> for those of you who grew up in Jamestown, you remember those horses plowing the snow. For those of you who have never heard this before, go on Google, Google Jamestown, New York, horses snow removal, and you'll find a picture of horses plowing snow in Jamestown. Now, for all of those functions, as, you, as you've already heard, the mayor of Jamestown was paid $10,500, and it was considered a part-time job. Our current mayor, who's going to be our next speaker, will probably tell you that in 2019 dollars, the job probably doesn't pay a whole lot more. <laughs> So what I want to do next is introduce Sam Teresi, who's going to talk about the shoes that he's filled and the influence that Stan Lundin has had on his life and his career. Sam. Ashley, that was a wonderful video. Kidder and I were kind of amusing during it, however, that take a look at those lapels. You could probably uh, land a Allegheny Airlines Convair <laughs> prop jet on those back in the day. The style kind of eluded the 70s in a lot of, a, a lot of ways, but um, before I get to my remarks, um, I do want to clear the record on one thing. When I made my decision back in February that uh, I was not going to seek a sixth term, one of the first people I called was Stan Lundeen. He's always been a friend and a straight shooter and a mentor of mine over the years. And I called him and I asked him, I want to make this for the record, point blank. Stan, will you run again for mayor of Jamestown? We need you. Your community is calling upon you. And he immediately hung the phone up on me. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was my answer or he was watching a Duke-Wake Forest game at that point in time and Duke was down by two points. So, uh, 
Before I do offer my remarks, I was contacted by a mutual friend of ours a few days ago, and he asked if I would please bring this to the ceremony and read it on his behalf. Dear Stan, as you gather this day in your beloved hometown of Jamestown, New York, I wanted to take a moment to join your many family members and friends to offer you my best wishes during this celebration of your half century of service to your hometown, the state, and our nation. It will come as surprise to no one that I have long considered your understated yet determined leadership style as a model for much of my own method of service as a public official. From your work as mayor to your decade of service in Congress to eight years as lieutenant governor to your many civic endeavors in your post-governmental career, your dignified, selfless manner contributed to your effectiveness at every post in which you served. Your style was not of that of bombast or the hyperactive, but was rather of the steady determination necessary to identify a focus, sustain it, and see the project or goal through to a successful conclusion. Sadly, in our present world of 24-hour news cycles, and here today, gone tomorrow issues of the moment, we see far too little of that style in our government. Stan, while I am saddened that I could not attend today's celebration, I am, as always, honored by the many years of friendship and support that you have shown to me. My best wishes go out to you and yours, as well as my thanks for the countless numbers of the contributions you have made to this community. Warmly, Brian Higgins, Member of Congress, 26th District of New York. Brian also sent along to me a copy of Public Law 111-27 that was passed on June 19, 2009, establishing the Stan Lundeen Post Office in Jamestown, New York. Sadly, the plaque for that was lost in the move from the public service location of one side of the building to the other side. But with that arsenal in hand now from Congressman Higgins, we've convinced the postmaster to reestablish the Stan Lundeen sign and plaque in the lobby of the Jamestown Post Office. Thank you, Congressman Higgins. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but the best man that I ever knew, Stan Lundeen's a close second, but the best man that I ever knew spent his lifetime trying to teach his three children three fundamental lessons of life. Spend your time serving others and not yourself. In that service to others, do big things. Big things that go beyond your time and your time in this place. And always remember, it's not about what you accomplish during your lifetime. It's what you inspire others to accomplish during theirs. I think those words apply to my good friend and my mentor, Stan Lundeen, better than anybody that I've dealt with during my public life serving this community. Uh, Stan is a real mentor, a friend, and an example to folks. He's a teacher, he's an inspiration, and also he's the reason that a lot of us are here today. Not just in this theater, but serving the community. Names like Morganti, Zanetta, D'Angelo, Lamancuso, Jurassi, Trusso, Alessi, Raffa, Lombardo, Tominia. I know that sounds like the credits rolling at an episode of The Sopranos. <laughs> Kidder, Parment. Multiple Carlsons, too many to mention. 
Steve and John Y and Swan and others, on and on. Larson, Barber, Tracy, Lasser, Chadwick, Rochelle, Chevry, Kinney, Olson, Hall, and countless others throughout the community, including an 11-year-old wide-eyed boy that had a chance to meet the one-term young mayor of Jamestown running for his re first re-election in 1971. When Stan Lundeen showed up at the sixth grade class of Audrey Shannon in MJ Fletcher Elementary School, as we were doing a segment on public service and local elections. And it went a little bit like this. Stan stood up in front of the room and he got that kind of little wry smile on his face in the photograph there. And he looked out across the landscape of about 30 students and he says, this looks like warm, friendly territory for me as he looked out at a sea of white and blue Stan Lundeen bumper stickers affixed to every single desk in the room. <laughs> I learned that day a couple of lessons of public service. The first was, is to stand by the youth of the community teach them well, capture their imagination, engage them in the process. And the other one was not to be a cheap Swede politician like Stan buying the cheapest bumper stickers out there. <laughs> because it took me three days after school scraping those off the fronts of the desk. <laughs> and since then in my own political campaign, I've only bought the high quality peelable bumper stickers and then converted to the very expensive magnets in years gone by. Uh, Stan, um, in light of all the lessons that you have given over the years, the work that you've done, the lives that you've touched, the people that you've inspired, I'd like to offer this on behalf of all those folks that I just mentioned, the folks that uh, you have touched over the years and that 11-year-old boy at MJ Fletcher Elementary School. And like George Borello, I am going to take the opportunity to read this. Whereas we honor Stan Lundeen, who has provided more than 50 years of outstanding public service to the betterment of this city, region, state, and our nation. And whereas Stan spent his public service career working tirelessly on behalf of the interest of those he represented. And whereas we join together with all greater Jamestown area residents in thanking Stan for being a true ambassador and an advocate for the needs of our community. And whereas we praise Stan for his incredible work over the years that has touched and positively impacted the lives of literally thousands of people. Now therefore I, Samuel Teresi, mayor of the great city of Jamestown, to hereby proclaim Monday, November 4th, 2019, as Stan Lundeen Day in the city of Jamestown and call upon all residents throughout the greater Jamestown region to both reflect upon Stan's impressive record of accomplishments and to follow his dedicated and inspirational example of public service. And witness whereof, I hereunto have set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Jamestown to be affixed this eighth day of September 2019. Congratulations, Stan. <laughs> Unlike my friend Mr. Borello, I'm going to make Stan work for this one. He's going to have to wait until November 4th. And for those of you that might be scratching your heads asking why, that's 50 years to the day that he was elected mayor of Jamestown. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, last thing I'd like to do is to challenge, channel uh, Peter Falk in his classic role of Columbo. Excuse me, sir, we're not done yet. There's one other order of business that I want to take care of here, sir. So can you please join me down here at the lectern? And I would ask 
any and all of your family members that can join you down here as well. Mark, John, Sarah, can you, can you, can you make it down? This is some, oh, more coming. I've got to get Sarah down here, too. And unlike my Erastus root comments before that were met in jest, in my book, and I think I know a little bit about this job over the years, this is the best mayor tied with two other mayors in my book. <laughs> Sam Carlson the innovator, the Republican socialist that built a lot of this community, Steve Carlson, the guy, the administrator that could make the trains run on time and uh, was a builder and an investor in infrastructure, not only here in this city, but throughout the greater Jamestown area. And Stan Lundeen, who has fulfilled to a T the third of my father's edicts in life Remember, it's not about what you accomplish during your lifetime. It's what you inspire others to accomplish during theirs. And that's what you've done, my friend, over the years. I'd like to read this for you, if I could. To the Honorable Stanley N. Lundeen. Dear Mayor Lundeen, on behalf of our 35,000 residents, it is my pleasure to formally present to you the key to the city of Jamestown. As I know that you are well aware, this is the highest honor awarded by New York's Great Pearl City. It is bestowed upon individuals and organizations that have attained significant achievements and notoriety in public service, private business, and within a variety of other academic, social, and cultural arenas. On behalf of my fellow Jamestowners, thank you for all that you have done through your lifetime of selfless, noble, and noteworthy public service to make our great city an even better place in which to live, work, play, and raise a family. Most importantly, thank you for your fine lifetime example of what public service can and should always be about. During the coming years, may your wisdom, experience, and ongoing efforts continue to serve as a role model and inspiration to us all. On behalf of the 35,000 residents of the city of Jamestown, Mayor Lundeen, it's my honor to present to you the key to the city of Jamestown, New York, and the inscription reads, the key to the city of Jamestown, New York, Stanley N. Lundeen, a lifetime of public service, mayor, congressman, lieutenant governor, and most importantly, citizen, September 8th, 2019. Thank you. Wait, no, you come back over here. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Having these next two speakers here uh, is a really big deal. Um, that I know their dad is as proud of them as they are of him, of him. And in preparation for this program, I watched quite a few hours of video that Greg Peterson had filmed with members of the Lundeen family. And I felt I got to know Mark and John Lundeen from watching that video. These two guys are great spokespeople. Um, that, that what they have to say about Stan, no one else can say. <laughs> and when I, when I asked, the well, first person I spoke to was Mark. And I said, Mark, can you come on September 8th? And Mark says, yes, I can be there, but I'm not sure about my brother John. And when, when a couple of weeks ago, when Mark found out that John was going to be here, he said, can I just turn this over to John? Can I, like, not speak? And it's like, no, no, that's not an option. We want to hear from both of them. And I'm going to turn this over to both of them. They can speak in any order they want or anything they'd like, to, any way they'd like to handle this. But I want to thank you guys for coming. And I know it's a big deal that you're here. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sam and, and Joe, and thank you so much to everybody at the Jackson Center, Kristen, 
and particularly Ashley, Ashley, any letter of recommendation from any Lundeen for whatever purpose is yours, okay? After uh, crawling through my, my aunt's basement. But no, this is, this is a, a real pleasure, obviously, for, for Mark and I. I've known my father my whole life. <laughs> That was, my, that was my test line to see if, you know, we're in the Comedy Hall of Fame uh, place here, so you guys, are, you guys are with me. But no, it's really a pleasure to be here celebrating Dad's work for Jamestown, Chautauqua County, and New York State. And I don't think there's anywhere better to do it than the Jackson Center. Um, it's interesting to me when I heard about this that, the, that you're using the word integrity in, as a title of the program. This is something that I've always related to my dad, uh, or a word that I've related with my dad, not only in the public uh, specter, but also in, in the pers in a, on a personal level. So I looked up the definition of integrity. It's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. But there's a second definition that's also interesting. That's the state of being whole and undivided. I think that you, Dad, really represent both of those definitions. When I think about my dad, um, I can't tell the mayoral stories because I wasn't born in 1970. Um, but I, I think back to the congressional years and then the lieutenant governor years. And I think about the campaigns, and my dad, particularly when Mark and I were really little, every two years had really difficult campaigns. Um, but I think about uh, the 1994 campaign when my father was run, running one last time with uh, the late Governor Cuomo. So I was, I, I think, a sophomore in college and had a couple of days off on a fall break for the end of the campaign and so I called dad up and said hey you know I'd, I'd love to finish out this campaign with you I didn't know it'd be your last campaign dad but anyhow uh, so I call him up and I say you know wh what are we going to do these four days and he, dad says oh we're going to go to Schenectady and then Plattsburgh and Watertown and then Ithaca and I said oh dad that sounds like a great long weekend and he said no that's the first day <laughs> So, needless to say, it wasn't exactly a relaxing fall break for me, but it, but it was really interesting. Just an example from that same year of who he is just as a person um, is, as you know, he was, as he says, elected into the private sector. Ashley, I think you said that he retired from politics or something, but he was elected into the private sector uh, with that election. And late that election night, I call him up and yeah, I'm a little distraught. I know that this is something that meant a lot to my father. And then obviously, you know, your, your dad just has lost his job. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, he says to me, I say, oh, dad, you know, I'm so sorry about this. And he says, look, don't worry about this. I think about my grandparents coming over from Sweden and for me to be able to do all of this, to go this far and have all of these wonderful experiences you know, they wouldn't have me feeling sorry for myself for a second. So here's my father consoling me on his own uh, election day, which is, which is kind of funny. The other part of the integrity story is really just all of this. I mean, so many of you people have known my father for so long, what Mayor Teresi was saying, just about having, being an inspiration for so many people. And I think that's really about um, you know, just being the whole, the part of integrity about, you know, being whole and undivided. You're whole and undivided with Chautauqua County and Jamestown and with all of these people uh, who you've been around with so long. Um, you know, Chuck Hall was talking about in the year 1932, start, oh, it was 72? That's right. <laughs> working with, uh, with my starting to work with my father and I mean it's just a testament to so many people have known you for so long but that I think you know there's more than just this story I mean I think we could be standing here celebrating someone who had had a had a long career and really had, you know had a lot of integrity um, but not you know and lived his or whole life as a, as a good person an honest person but I think that you know, this story is not unlike the story of Robert Jackson 
that's partially about integrity, but more about how my dad used his integrity. He used it to work hard with acumen, honesty, and oneness or wholeness so that other people can live with dignity. So I think about you know the 1960s when my dad was graduated from a New York City law or New York University Law School in New York City to have a guy like that who probably had a lot of options come back to Jamestown and part of what he did in those days was being a public defender. Um, you know that is really working so that other people can live with dignity. Probably some people you didn't even particularly like back in those days, Dad, but that was, that was very impressive. Also, as a mayor working on so many issues that so many of you people have already mentioned is just really working so that other people can live with dignity. I'm not sure about the architecture how, on City Hall, how dignified that is, but that's another story. <laughs> in his congressional, his congressional career as well, Dad, I mean, working so hard on, on so many of the issues, on employee ownership issues, working so hard as well for the Native American populations in your district. Again, just an, just an example of how other people, you're working so hard that other people can live with more dignity. And then even coming back here in his post-political career, um, you know, working for the Jackson Center, I work for a nonprofit organization. I understand nonprofit organizations and sometime several years ago, dad was asking me about it. It may have been the Jackson Center, another endeavor saying, yeah, you know, the board of, of directors or, you know, maybe head up a board of directors. And I know that that's a thankless task. Um, and, you know, I probably tried to dissuade you from it, but fortunately you didn't heed my, vi my advice just because, again, this is just who you are. It's just someone who's working with so much integrity so that other people can, can live with a little bit more dignity. So, again, as the mayor, I believe, said on behalf of literally thousands of people, most of whom we don't even know, uh, thanks for all of your contributions and thanks for being an inspiration for me and, and so many other people here. So thank you. He's older, so he gets to go first. That's how it goes. Um, you know, I knew that today was a big day. I didn't know how big it was until it was the fourth quarter. There's six minutes to go. The bills are down six. And dad says, let's go. We got to go. I'm like, are you sick, Dad? Is something wrong here? They won, by the way. See, I'm a Cleveland fan, and it's like one and all. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I mean, what do we do here, right? Um, you know, my, my part that I really wanted to talk about is not Dad's public life, but his contribution in a couple roles that you haven't heard a lot about. Um, you know, for me, as, as his son, the contribution that he made and John in my life is, can't, can't be overstated. Um, we didn't grow up together, and Dad was always someone that took the time, no matter how busy he was, to reach out and be in touch with us and understand what's going on in our lives. Um, John and I were quintessential young boys, right? We were playing sports, beating each other up, trying to get as muddy as possible. And it wasn't easy for a, a dad that's not with you every day to break through that and get information out of us. Uh, so, so much so that, you know, many times uh, he'd be talking to us on the phone and he'd, he'd start to not hear answers coming back from us. And it'd be like, hey, guys, turn off the TV, right? Maybe listen to what we're talking about. Um, you know, we always really appreciated that. And it meant so much to us that we, we could go through that. When we were in high school, we would be able to see each other on a more regular basis based on what he was doing around the state of New York. And we had some amazing opportunities together. But I think it was really once we became college age and further, that we started to develop a, a deep friendship. 
and the advice and the um, you know subtle ways in which he guided us through our lives and allowed us to make great decisions and become the people we were is, is it was just an amazing contribution that we'll never forget. Um, all that said, everyone uh, has talked about the many different roles that, that Dad's had over the years, but I think he'd agree with me that his most special role is that of grandfather. And we have, uh, you know, two of the grandkids here. The other two are in Guatemala. And, you know, when Owen, my first son, was born, uh, I remember just this sheer unbridled joy that um, I heard on the other side of the phone. And it's carried on to this day. I mean, he is their biggest fan. They uh, just relish in every single moment that they get with our grandkids. And you can see the special relationship that they have with Owen and Natalie and Sarah Maria and Sophia. And so we just want to say that we appreciate you, Dad, for your role in our life and your role with our grandkids. And you know, we look forward to many more years of you uh, celebrating the kids and taking care of all of us. Thanks. I want to introduce a, a fellow Jackson Center board member and a longtime personal friend, another name you've heard today, Joe Zanetta. Uh, Joe is going to talk to us about an effort that he has been spearheading on behalf of the Jackson Center to create and fund an educational endowment in Stan Lundin's name. Come on up, Joe. Thank you, Sam. And in the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that in 1969, I was the chairman of the Teenage Republicans. <laughs> it's true. Like Henry Hall. And I was campaigning for Charlie Magnuson, who was a great person. And it didn't happen the next day like it did for Henry Hall. But it happened a few months later when I was reading the paper and saw what this man was doing. And he was young, he was 30 years old, and I recognized that his campaign slogan, A New Direction for Jamestown, actually was going to happen. And so I never officially became a Democrat, but I did become a Lundin supporter every year since then. So it's a great time to be here, it's a great tribute to Stan. And I want to talk about what we're planning to do, actually what we've done to honor Stan. So, Endowment. Endowment is something that uh, John mentioned, um, working for nonprofits. Nonprofits rely on philanthropy. So the Robert H. Jackson Center is no different than any other nonprofit. It needs an anchor and it needs money in the bank. So we're fortunate through many generous donors over the past 15 years, through strong leadership of Greg Peterson as chair, Stan Lundin as chair, others. Raleigh Kidder as the founding director after Dan Braddon. I had it right. Um, so we have about a $2 million endowment today, but we probably need $5 million, $10 million. So when in the academic world, when a professor, a worthy professor, is given the title of full professor, he becomes an endowed shareholder. And that means money. Money comes with it. So what we've done in the last few months is raise money for the Stan Lundin Education Fund. The fund is at the Chautauqua County Regional Foundation. It is benefiting this organization, the Robert H. Jackson Center. And thanks to some generous gifts, thanks to the Lene Foundation, thanks to many board members, we now have $75,000 in an endowment for Stan. Now, I promised Stan I would be gentle, 
not the Los Angeles approach. No, no pledge cards, no raising hands, just um, an invitation. Um, I live in Los Angeles, so I'm not in the local community. Sam lives in Washington, D.C. So although we're spearheading it, we're not here, and all of you are here. So we invite you to consider your own philanthropy in the future, your own desire to honor this wonderful man, and make a gift to the Stan Lundeen Endowment Fund. Again, you can talk to Kristen McMahon. Kristen, where are you? Uh, Kristen's our wonderful president, and she will gladly take your money. Uh, Marion, Marion Beckerink um, is here, our great development director. I don't know where she is. Marion will take your, your money. But, but it's not about your money. It's about your desire to honor Stanley Nelson Lundeen, who's done so much for Jamestown, for Chautauqua County, for the state of New York. So we want to get the endowment to $100,000. Actually, one person could write a check tonight for $25,000, and it would be over. Uh, but, but Sam and I will be committed to continuing the endowment fund, and I hope I met your standards of being soft and gentle. It's uh, <laughs> another story. I have a, um, in the interests of bipartisanship, by the way, Andy Goodell's here, state assemblyman, wave, somewhere I saw Andy. Uh, thank you. Um, what better tribute to the most prominent Democrat after Robert H. Jackson to come out of Jamestown than to quote a Republican president at this. And, and this is serious. This is a, one of my favorite all-time quotes um, by Teddy Roosevelt. It's a brief paragraph, and I'm going to read it. Teddy Roosevelt left the White House in 1909, and then he kind of regretted it. So he was thinking about running again, and he did run again in 1912, and he was defeated. Um, and he was in Europe, and he wrote this. It's called The Man in the Arena. It's a little bit about him, but it's more about Stan Lundeen. So listen carefully. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. That's Stan Lundin. Now the highlight of the program is Sam Morganti introducing the man in the arena, Stan Lundin. Stay there for a sec. After hearing from today's speakers and watching the video, I can add very little to what you've already heard about Stan Lundin, other than a personal note of how I feel privileged and honored to have been able to put together today's program. There's so many of you who have helped, so many of you have taken a personal note in this program, and like everyone else who's been here and associated with Stan Lundeen and the people that he brought to public service over the past 50 years, he's given us an opportunity to serve this community. And the, the, the best I can say is thank you, Stan Lundeen. Please come on up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be mercifully brief. <laughs> first, uh, first of all, a few acknowledgments. First, my wonderful wife, Sarah.
You've heard from our sons, John and Mark, and I'm very proud of them. And uh, Mark mentioned that, now you stand when I introduce you, please. Owen Lundin and Natalie Lundin. Sarah Maria and Sophia Wade, they're here in spirit. <laughs> uh, it's a long way from Guatemala. My sister Barb and her husband Mike Goldman. <laughs> Betsy, our niece, and Jamie, her husband. And also in spirit, our niece Emily and her husband Frankie, and they have a baby, Frankie the Fourth. <laughs> I want to thank uh, the Robert H. Jackson Center staff, uh, Kristen McMahon, uh, you're a great leader, Sherry Schutter, we wouldn't even have continued to exist, I think, without your help. Marion Beckerink is terrific. And last, but certainly not least, Nicole Gustafson. Uh, they're great people. Uh, they're a great staff. Only four of them. Incidentally, all female. How about that? Uh, and she has been acknowledged, but Never too much, but Ashley Gray, you did a great job, and I appreciate it very much. I also want to acknowledge all of the Jackson Center board, uh, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, that, that's greatly appreciated. And so many friends. I, I was going to point out a couple who came from Joe came from California, but who came from uh, Virginia and Ohio and all over, but I'm afraid that I'll leave somebody out. So thank you all for coming and being a part of this. Uh, at least one respondent, though, to the notice of this meeting responded, I didn't know Stan had died. <laughs> <laughs> I want to assure you this is not a funeral. <laughs> I'm not going to do any lengthy reflection on my career. Uh, as has been mentioned, uh, I was inspired by John F. Kennedy uh, to a life in public service. And Robert Jackson, uh, I, I did my senior paper in, in college on Jackson. And I felt like if a guy from a remote part of the state of New York can go to the heights that he did, maybe somebody else can uh, make a contribution. 25 years in politics and public service really, I guess, was highlighted by elections. Uh, that first election in 1969 was, frankly, just Great. I mean, they are friends, uh, distinguished people in the community coming together. And um, our Joe alluded to it, but uh, Charlie Magnuson, who is really a very nice man, uh, had been elected by two to one two years before. And all 12 city council members were Republicans. And at our election, we carried eight out of the 12. So uh, that, was, that was an exciting year. The special election in March of 1976 was uh, fantastic. But I, I want to share one incident with you. Uh, there were a bunch of businessmen who had supported me for mayor, but were really a little reluctant about my go supporting me for Congress. And we thought, what better way than to invite these business people to a meeting and let them ask me any questions they wanted. 
And what better way to illustrate that I wasn't exactly antithetical to business than to have my dad, who was a businessman, there. And it went very well. And finally it was Paul Sandberg, some of you may remember, uh, who said, Stan, you've answered our questions and I thank you. Just tell us what we can do to help you. And I thought, great, exit line. And I start out the door and my dad says, wait a second, why are you a Democrat? <laughs> now, if there were 40 people in the room, I think they were all guys, if there were 40 people in the room, 38 of them were Republicans. My mind never went faster than I said, Dad, remember when I was a kid, all the kids rooted for the Cleveland Browns, and I was for the New York Giants, and all the kids in baseball rooted for either the Yankees or the Indians, and I rooted for the Boston Red Sox. Well, all the kids were Republicans, so I became a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, John, I think it was, made allusion to 94 uh, when we re got rescued from public service. Uh, uh, Mark was in college at the time and had invited a friend. And he told this friend, you know, there's no place as exciting as uh, victory night uh, campaign headquarters. Well, we were in a suite in a hotel in New York, and as soon as people know the outcome, they vanish. And this place is, this nice suite is almost empty and, and trash around and everything. And this kid turns to Mark and says, this is your idea of excitement? <laughs> My post-political and public service career has been interesting and rewarding. Uh, many employee ownership ventures, including the U.S. Investigation Services, which was the largest privatization of any government entity uh, in the history of our country. And, uh, became an employee-owned company, very successful. My service on the American Capital Board, which taught me a lot about business, and particularly it, uh, initiating uh, the Chautauqua County Health Network and the integrated delivery system. Uh, I'm very proud of that, and some of my friends uh, who have been involved in that are with us tonight. Many times I've been asked, what really motivates you? And I don't, I hope I'm not being too political when I say just to make a positive difference in people's lives. And I, I guess in both uh, my public service and subsequently, I've tried to do that. So in conclusion, this is not a funeral. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> I want to add one small note of thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, in addition to all of the people who th Stan thanked, I want to add Greg Peterson and some others from the staff here who um, were instrumental in helping to accomplish what we did tonight. Uh, there was someone named Brian Hill who helped Ashley with the video. I want to make sure he gets thanked. And I want to thank people who were in the video. I want to thank Chuck D'Angelo, Joe Girasi. Uh, I want to thank Pat Kinney. And I want to make sure that everyone knows that these people all volunteered their time, everybody was willing to help, and that this was a, a wonderful task to have done. Now, before you leave, out the door to the left is the exhibit that we've talked about. And I want to make sure that everybody who wants to gets a chance to see that tonight. And if you're not, not able to see it tonight, it will be on display for some time here at the Jackson Center. So thank you, Kristen, as well. So thank you for attending.